I'm Tass Mellis of The Starters. This is Ben Golliver with the Open Floor Podcast. Hi, I'm Kristen Ludlow from NBA Inside Stuff. I'm OG Ananobi of the Toronto Raptors. Hey, I'm Elena Deladon, and welcome to the Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Double Clutch NBA Podcast. My name is Matthew Wellington and I'm joined tonight by Mike Miller. Hey. And we've got Nick Whitfield. Good to be back, guys. Yeah, it's, it's been a while for me, but <laughs> a lot's happened in the uh, coronavirus pandemic. I unfortunately um, lost my nan, which was which was tough. But, um, that, well, she didn't go in the hospital with um, COVID-19, but unfortunately she did get it while in hospital and she took that out to a uh, to a care home, which seems to have been a thing that has happened all over the country at the moment so um yeah that was that was difficult and um I've, i'm currently on furlough so I'm, i've got a lot of free time there's no basketball to watch i've been reading books and doing bits and bobs but every day is kind of the same at the moment and as i was saying to nick just before we started recording like my <laughs> sleeping pattern is all over the place like it's like stuck it's like 2012 when i just started double clutch and i was working part-time at tesco and i could just <laughs> stay up until four in the morning watching lakers games like it's all over the place. How have you two been? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I, I'm I'm not missing the commute, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I also experienced the same uh, issue you did, Matt, lo- losing a grandparent recently, which is, yeah, I think um, something a lot of people are all kind of experiencing at this time. And it, it's the weirdest thing about it is every kind of normal behavior in how you would grieve is kind of not possible because of how we're Mm -hmm. locked down and not able to really uh get close to other people and stuff so yeah tough tough period um but it's one of those things i think what uh, if uh there's any light in the last few months it's been that this strange circumstance we've all found ourselves in has actually allowed, provided a sort of context for Black Lives Matter and social equality to become kind of way more on the agenda than it ever would be if normal life was going on. So, yeah, I think that's the the big uh, light to take away from this period. Yeah, and obviously um, Hugh did a podcast last week with James Wade, the head coach of the uh, Chicago Sky Go and check it out if you haven't, because he's far more qualified to talk about what he has experienced as a black man than any of us mm-hmm. three are sitting here. And um, yeah, we've been we were quite vocal at the fact that we're we're a bit of well, we are all white guys who write for this site, and you know it's not our choice. We've we just ne- we've never had anybody um, sort of come forward and to to sort of contribute with us. Um, but we're we're not you know we're not against against that happening. Um, but yeah, it's it's Black Lives Matter movement has brought brought it to light, and we're you know we 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 profit and we benefit off a off a you know an African American sport, I guess, um, the NBA and the culture that goes around it, the hip hop and everything. So you can't, I mean, even if you're a rock music fan, you can't not you know take a side because rock music comes from sort of black black musical traditions as well. So. It's one of those things, but um, on to a sort of a, a more, I don't know, I guess positive note. Um, last week there was a announcement on Thursday from Sony about the new PlayStation. Um, during that, the NBA 2K guys uh, snuck in a little teaser for NBA 2K21, um, and basically we got a, a like a one and a half minute video of a lot of sweat. Um, I think it's probably the best way to describe it. Um, six years ago, 2K did something similar at another event uh, during E3. Um, and they showed LeBron James sort of talking to himself, and it was the first time really that they'd managed to capture LeBron James properly in a 2K game because he looked a bit odd um, before that. But now with Zion Williamson at the helm, um, it looks like he was fully motion captured and shoes looked amazing. Everything about that looked amazing. And yeah, I just wanted to get your guys' quick thoughts on sort of the next jump up in in the 2K because you get you get used to playing the same game over the course of sort of five, six years. And the, obviously the graphics engine hasn't changed in a while. So are you are you excited for a more realistic looking basketball simulation? Uh, well, apart from the fact I'm going to have to shout out for a new console <laughs> in order to, to, to see it. I mean, it looked phenomenal, um, but that was the cinematic trailer. I want to see the in-game footage. Uh, we know 2K yeah. love their sweat. Um <laughs> And it's, well, you know, so it's be proud of if you can do realistic sweat and bucket loads of it, then go for it. Because, you know, animating water is 
is yeah. extremely difficult. But it looked it looked phenomenal. Um, I like the fact they've teased us a bit that it's not necessarily going to be Zion on the cover. It's probably going to be multiple athletes. And uh, it just, bring it on, bring it on. I'll be intrigued to see whether they stall the release of it in time for 20, uh, 2021 season. Yeah, I, I guess the video game world's in a bit of a strange place at the moment because you've got all these massive releases and obviously two, uh, two consoles due out at the end of the year. And at the moment, most people aren't working or manufacturing chains aren't at full production levels. And yeah, it's it's a strange one, but it looks like 2K have been working on this from the ground up, which is what they did when they transferred over from PS3 to this current generation of um, consoles. So you get an entirely new graphics engine. I don't think it will affect this uh, this this generation's version of the game. You still get a you still get a very high product, I'm sure. But the benefit will be if you spend the extra money and you've got the console, you will get a you know a vastly superior looking um, basketball simulation featuring drastically improved load speeds. I think they said two seconds it takes to load the game That's now, mad. which is which is insane, um, especially for people who've you know grew up with like the Amiga and things like that, where you had to wait a while. Um, but two seconds for a loading time, new game modes, new brand partnerships, apparently the greatest soundtrack ever, but I'm sure they say that every year. Um, so that's just one of those one of those marketing phases. But um, yeah, drastically improved load speeds and unriv- an unrivaled basketball simulation, really. And EA haven't said anything yet, but they still do the NBA Live series. And I know they took a bit of a hiatus for that one. Um, do they still do the series? For? Yeah, they do. And the last one was actually a pretty good game. Which was the um, last one? Oh god, was hey, it sixteen or seventeen? Exactly. So they don't still do it because we're now at twenty. <laughs> they took a they took a bit of a gap, I think. Got left um, behind. They've, they've had many, many, many gaps, but it, yeah, it's 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 it sucks really because when you've got two games on competing, they 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 make each other better. Agree, so agree. That's what we need, really. Um, because you know the less said about NBA two K servers, the better. But um, <laughs> we we do we, we are all NBA two K fans here, and we. We should at some point get some sort of um, tournament together for us lot and just sit, see who is the um, who's the two K king. Nick, you've got to have an opinion on on the new two K because you've got you do all the, like the PC gaming and stuff and <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge gamer so I couldn't be more excited for the new two K. I played this year's a lot and um, I think what you guys were getting at there like with the different modes is just how incredible a game it is in terms of. Primarily, I play my team as a mode when I play 2K because I like like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie I just make 90s teams every year because that's what I like. <laughs> but uh, every year I'm allowed to do it, so I do it. Um, but it's just incredible to me how many different modes there are that all have such depth and um, like stuff to do that. I only play one of the modes and even in that one mode, I don't feel like I have enough time to really kind of do everything I could do on it in terms of like if I was like a real OCD completionist. So it's just like what a value package that game really is in terms of like you could play that and nothing else and still have like time to do other stuff. So it's pretty crazy. Uh, On the the sweat thing, I was really excited to see that. (laughs) If I had one critique of uh, this year's game, it was that I couldn't see the players' bodily fluids enough. So (laughs) more bodily fluids. Uh, It's funny how you mentioned like playing a singular mode. Whenever I do it, I just get far too into my career and I have to put it on like 12 minute quarters and things like that. So it takes me- You're proper realism, man. that's, That's what I'll play. Got to get those stats up. Is it too soon for them to put Kobe on the special edition cover again? No, I don't think so. I, th- I could see them doing that. I don't think that. so. He was an odds-on favourite for it, wasn't he? Do you it? know what? But, that um... would be... Um, you remember the Jordan edition game they did where you uh, there was like a specific yeah. mode to play MJ's classic games again. I'd love that if they did that for Kobe's career. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they do. But with the shift to the... The next gen, we always get this sort of super, you know, incredible teaser trailer. And then a couple of weeks later, we'll get a proper gameplay trailer, which is obviously what Mike was alluding to. Um, when they did it in 2014 or whenever it was, we had the LeBron thing. And then we had a, like a sizzle reel the week later. And it just blew everybody away at the time. And it still is a really impressive looking game. Um, that engine's held up really well. And it took a while for the likes of, you know, FIFA and some of the other sports franchises to sort of get an engine that was... Uh, you know, equal to, if not a little bit better than um, the 2K engine. But with a new generation comes, you know, new technology and ray tracing and all this stuff that comes with the new consoles. So hopefully we get a, you know, a real big 
a leap up and it's going to be true 4k for everybody who's got a new swanky tv these days and i'm not gonna lie i had to google what ray tracing was when kirk said it on the uh on the the recap video i was like what and uh now i completely understand because i have a wikipedia definition just to my left yeah well kirk Kirk is a massive geek as well (laughs) he's he's a he's a huge video gamer just like nick well i think we probably all spend far too much time on video games but um yeah nba 2k21 looks like it's um it's it's getting off to a good start and we'll, we'll obviously keep you updated with any any news and bits and bobs that come out with that one. Mm. It's going to be interesting to see how they launch it this year because we've had some excellent access the past couple of years to events. and Yeah, definitely, yeah. <sighs> can't see that being the same this year. So moving on from um, NBA 2K, we'll move on to obviously the NBA, which is the main reason we're here. Um, they are restarting the season on the 31st of July. Uh, there were reports that they were going to move it forward a day or two, but I think there's there's not much credibility to those. We're going to get 22 teams returning for the start of the season. That includes basically everybody who was in the top eight from the Eastern Western Conference, and then a few of the um, sort of stragglers. Somehow the Suns um, got in there. I'm sure Ross McLeod's very happy, but <laughs> you, you've added a few extras in there, and the, the Washington Wizards and the Kings and the Pelicans, basically anyone who was fighting for an eighth seed, really. Um, and they're going to do sort of an interesting play in for those teams aren't they Mike yeah so they've they've got eight eight regular season games lined up which everyone will play Uh, but if you are outside of the traditional one to eight seedings but you're within three and a half games of the eighth seed well if you're the ninth seed and you're three and a half games back then you'll get a play in tournament where basically the ninth seed plays the eighth seed the ninth seed win they have to win again so they play two games but if the eighth seed win just one of those games then they go straight to the playoffs, which probably isn't the best explanation you've ever heard because it sounded quite convoluted <laughs> in my head as I said it. But basically, if you're the eighth seed, you need to play an extra game to get yourself in, assuming someone is within three and a half games of you. I guess, well, we haven't had the schedules out yet, have we? So there's, we can't necessarily talk about who's going to be playing um, who, but that's one of the bonuses for some of these teams who had harder run-ins towards the second half of the season is they're going to get... They might get an easier run in for, from from now on, but um, it's not going to be that easy though, because all the all the real rubbish from the the season is gone. So the, whatever yeah. schedule they're going to have is going to probably face a number of competent playoff teams. caliber teams, and then those on the outside. I think that's a tough run in whoever you whoever you are. Yeah, well, that's one of the Ross actually um, Ross McLeod messaged us on Twitter after when we were uh, asking for questions, and he asked are these regular season games the remaining eight that each of these teams are going to have to play going to be a bust given the lack of momentum for teams due to the virus? But I actually think it's probably going to be the opposite. You've got a bunch of guys who are rested. Certainly you look at the Blazers, they're going to benefit massively because they get Zach Collins back. Um, Josef Nurkic might come back. Whether or not they're playing at full strength, who knows? But you know that's a lot of size for them to get back and they're a hell of a lot better with those two in the lineup than they are with Hassan Whiteside and you know other player. Um, so that's a massive benefit for them. I think the Grizzlies, you know, they've had time to get some of their new players into into their position. So that's gonna that's gonna help them out. Um, Justice Winslow never actually got to play a game for them before coronavirus hit. Um, so he gets to fit in, and then you know, guys like LeBron James at the Lakers is gonna be rested and bearded, very bearded. <laughs> I'm intrigued to see how it's gonna pan out because there is a rest versus rust argument. There's a suggestion that younger yeah. teams are going to be able to to pick up the pace and play uh, at full speed quicker than these veteran teams. And it's it's how much access have these guys had? Because yeah, they get access to gyms all the time, but they've only had one on one drills for about a week and well, two weeks now. Um, and unless you are LeBron James, the likelihood is you live in quite a swanky <laughs> apartment, but an apartment nonetheless without access to a gym. So it's going to be intriguing to see how some of these guys have have stayed in shape. There's obviously the risk of if they're rushing back into shape too quickly, you get silly hamstring injuries, that sort of thing, which apparently the Bundesliga, whatever that is, has experienced. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not as clear cut as they're rested, they're all going to come back and go. And then even if they are, what is the point if you're already in, if you're already in the, the playoff seedings now? So say you are a Lakers, say you are a Bucks, are you going to go full pelt for those eight games? Because you already qualified for the playoffs. What's home court advantage? Well, they're the losers. They're the losers, aren't they? If they if they if they had it their way, they'd have gone straight into the playoffs. I'd imagine. 
No, because you need to, you need you can't go straight into playoff intensity. But my my point is like home court advantage is gone now. So whether you are the first seed or the fourth seed, yes, you're going to play maybe have a slightly tougher route to the finals. But you're going to have to go through the tough teams anyway to get to the to the NBA finals. So are they going to be full, going full strength? Are we going to see sort of sort of um, micro tanking where they're just resting? For the for the actual postseason, I don't know. It's uh, it's going to be an interesting. I don't one. think they're going. I don't playing only eight games and like four exhibitions before that. I don't think there's enough um, games for them to tank any of them. I I what I think is they will play hard in all the games, but they just won't really care if they lose them. Um, though I think one of the things you haven't mentioned that I'm interested to kind of follow when all the games start up again is. Players who have either like taken on a lot of the burden for their teams and like fizzled out historically in the playoffs, like uh, James Harden or a Chris Paul, whether <laughs> this format actually really suits those guys to have had an extended break and to come back and be like as close to fully fit as they're going to be, um, and like completely recharged with uh, and sort of resetting at the playoff end of the season. I wonder, and obviously, I don't know if you guys have been following how. Um, it looks like after Nikola Jokic, which is a different subject altogether, James Harden might be the uh, the next uh, skinny guy mm. from the off season. So, well, I call it the off season, the uh, the weird bit of time we've just been in. You know, we get muscle watch every year, <laughs> and seeing Harden normally normally Harden comes into the season out of shape with a little bit of a pot belly, <laughs> and then, like you say, he's gassed by game seventy. Uh, seeing him skinny is weird and how's that going to affect his game it'll be quicker you'd assume but is he going to be able to get into the the paint as easily mm. I guess it's a strength thing if he's been working out and putting on muscle then he's going to be as strong as he ever was but add to that the, the, the speed he's now going to gain from the fact that he weighs less it's I don't know <laughs> we'll have to see but uh, the, the Nuggets were one of those teams that were playing pretty well before the uh for the break so that they're going to be they're probably be all right but it, it brings it brings a question it's like what nick was just saying about are isolation heavy teams or these teams that are kind of built around one guy going to benefit from this because they you know they don't necessarily need to train as a team together that much i mean it sounds stupid considering it's a team sport but it might benefit the likes of houston it might benefit them certainly on the defensive end where you know some of their guys like pj tucker have had an increased amount of rest, which they wouldn't have got if they'd have been playing on the full eighty-two and then into the into the postseason. But I, I think I think that's a case of we we just don't really know. Like it's, it's like if you go and listen to the JJ Reddit podcast, um, Pat Connaughton was on there from the Milwaukee Bucks. And he was talking about he's he hasn't had a basketball, he hasn't had any, you know, he hasn't played basketball because he's just been cooped up in a flat basically so he's been running and cycling and you know peloton or whatever all these you know these things that people are doing at the moment um but the only basketball he's ever done it in the last few months has just been you know bouncing the basketball around his flat which is a bit weird because it sounds like he lives with his best friend and his best friend's fiance which is a bit <laughs> odd um <laughs> so there's a strange three going on there but um yeah whatever whatever floats your boat in milwaukee <laughs> I think you you touched on the Rockets there and that that actually that scares me because not only have you got a new version of Harden but Russ who is rusting 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 back to back (laughs) Um, because of his knees is we've seen the workout well well, I certainly have you've seen the workout videos where he's just getting going mad on these sort of plyometric exercises, things like that. He, I mean, he's had Kevin Hart there. Not that that says anything about his basketball abilities <laughs> at all, but this guy's going hard. Like, he's working out. There's there's no way that this guy's coming back with any ounce of, of not ready to play in him. The other thing I, th- yeah. I think that's interesting about the Rockets is we kind of saw when, um, when they first went to their, like, ultimate sort of end game small ball that they're playing now they were winning a lot of games just kind of by default because teams weren't ready to play them um and i think and they kind of fizzled out a little bit towards uh the stop in play as teams started to figure them out a little bit and teams were um watching each other's games to see how what was working against them and i feel like that resets again with the game starting up where they're so different to every other team that it's just kind of like weird to play them. And it's, you have to be so kind of uh, exactly switched Switched on on. with all defensive switches and everything that 
they'll probably overperform just because teams aren't ready to play them. How do you think it's going to fare when they get in, out of the eight-game regular season and into a seven-game series, though? Because obviously they're going to they're going to have proper I th- game I planning think them against them. More than any other team will depend on matchups. If they come up against LA, for example, that's a fascinating one. Uh, I mean, the Lakers, not the Clippers, because of the like big little yeah. dynamic going on there. Yeah, they beat the Lakers last time. Last time out with that that new hybrid lineup with no no true center so but then like the the consensus from nba um journalists and stuff at the moment is that this is it's all set up for the lakers i mean how much are you guys buying that like everyone just seems to forget that the milwaukee bucks were just playing at an you know an unbelievable level um going into this and i, I find it really difficult to imagine they're going to drop that afterwards they've been coming together as a team this past week they've been out in milwaukee doing the black lives matter marches as a team um and pat connington on that pod i mentioned has you know spoken really highly of janice this season and how he's grown as a player and he made some strange comparisons to damian lillard back when he was obviously in portland for i think it was two two seasons ago um talking about what what damian lillard is like as a leader and that um janice is now taking that on and has become one of those guys who's just totally respected by anybody in the league it doesn't matter if you're a veteran or if you're a young guy you just have that sort of level um field for him so are you guys buying that the Lakers are set up to just walk this postseason? My take on the Lakers is they're very top heavy. Um, and that's risky yeah. in this kind of environment where I think if Anthony Davis has been a bit shaky injury history wise, so were he to, um, and obviously I think all the players are going to be at increased risk of things like pulling the hamstrings or those kind of like, uh, injuries that are symptoms of not being at like 100% conditioning. Um, and the Lakers, were yeah. they to lose one of LeBron or Anthony Davis for any amount of time, are going to be at huge risk compared to, say, the Clippers, who are a lot deeper. And were they to, was Kawhi to miss a few games here or there, or Paul George or uh, any of their other big contributors, it kind of doesn't impact them as much. So if the Lakers are 100% healthy throughout the whole thing, they've probably they have to be at least one or one a in terms of favorites but they're also have more yeah. risk than say the clippers so mm. and then you've also got the crap shoot that is what if one someone gets covid because the, the minute that happens yeah. that, that that's and the likelihood is someone probably will get it at some point and it's how they control that and how what impact you know if it if it's lebron who gets it you know, they shut them down for, I think it's 10 days is the plan. And if... 10 days, and then they have to have two negative coronavirus tests to be able to go back and play again. So if, if you think about it, that's that's three games. That's a, that's a big swing in a playoff series. So I think yeah. there's, there's just so many things that they can't even, um, you know, plan for, essentially. It's it's going to be a real crapshoot of an off-season, an off-season, a post-season. It's- well, you've got that, and then you've got the fact that you've got all these superstar athletes locked up in Orlando for five or six weeks. And they made an interesting point on the JJ Reddick show about like you get to the end of the season, and if you're like the Suns or whatever, and you're you don't stand a chance of getting in that that AFC playoff, do you just give up and leave? Do you try and escape? Does Devin Booker like sneak onto a sneak into an Uber and? you know, try and get out of Orlando. I mean, there's, there's spikes in cases in Florida and Orlando as it is at the moment. Wait, so, so you think they're going to like, basically, they were, he was Shawshank out of there. That he thinks players was, was, will try and sneak out of there. And well, even there's a ca- the it's, weeks, they're saying they will... it's a campus now. It's not like the bubble's not the right word. It's a campus. You can come and go as you please, but you, you know, there is testing. And things I think like they're that. just putting a, what yeah. sounds like a nicer word on it. I think it's a brand thing. Or the campus if you call versus it bubble. The uh, lovely happy campus. <laughs> it sounds better. <laughs> what then? Then the the glorious bubble of health. I, that's not really catchy. You can tell I don't work in marketing. But then we're, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, we're talking about um, but, uh, coronavirus and uh, health in general. It's it's also one of the biggest risks is for the. Uh, perceived legitimacy of the season. If um, if, mul- mm-hmm. if multiple big names yeah. were 
um, to kind of be compromised in some way, uh, it would kind of raise the question of what the point of the whole thing was and the legitimacy of whoever wins. So, yeah, the, definitely. The thing that kind of worries me for the Lakers because uh, for them, the opportunity for LeBron, who at thirty five is is approaching the tail end of his career, this is a chance at a ring. If there's no restart to the season, there's no chance at the ring. But what worries yeah. me is if they're still playing games in September, maybe even October, I can't remember if it went as far as that, then there's a really sharp turnaround before the season next season starts theoretically in early December. That's that's a you know, if you if you've taken away but championship teams can complain every year that after they've logged heavy minutes in the playoffs, they are still recovering the start of the next season. If they've shortened the off season, I get they've had a big break now, but they've come in not necessarily in game shape, trying to play themselves into shape, getting into a position, then they have a quick downtime and start again. I wonder if they're still going to have fuel in the tank 60 games into next year. Yeah, well, we've we've said it before, like the amount of minutes that LeBron has, has averaged over the last what decade it's just been unbelievable even since his like Miami Heat days people were going on that he was he was playing too much because you'd be playing for the Heat you'd get to the finals you'd play a final series and then he'd go off and do you know a World Cup or an Olympics or something and then he'd be back doing the regular season again and it's the same here you've got the regular season resuming on the 31st of July that's supposed to schedule itself all the way through till the end of um, August I think and then you get the playoffs and then October 13th or something is the NBA draft. And then defense December 1st is the preliminary date for the start of the season again, which is just, it's completely bonkers. It- and don't forget there's a delayed, there's a delayed Olympics to play in as well for some of the top guys. <laughs> and that, that, We're all still working on the assumption the season tips off that something, you know, it's not set well, in stone. Thing, yeah. And what are your guys' thoughts on the the pushback, the Kyrie and um, uh, people Dwight like Howard. Dwight Howard who, who are stepping who are st- stepping up and saying essentially that we shouldn't start. There's a bigger issue going on socially. We should be concentrating on that versus essentially playing a game. Um, for, I'm keen to get your guys' thoughts because for me, I've kind of I can see both sides of the argument, and it's very difficult yeah, to. But- I know where I want it to go for for personal selfish i love basketball reasons reasons, (laughs) but i realize that there's a much wider thing at play here that that really needs addressing i think my my take is really that i completely get that perspective and i think i mean definitely in my lifetime there's never been and maybe never will be another context like this where the the issue of social change and social equality is on the agenda like it's never been before without anything really complicating that debate and that message. And so I completely understand not wanting to kind of bring back sport, which will kind of distract from that and kind of create that illusion of everything being back to normal, if you will. And I I guess the question really is with that mindset is whether players feel like they could um, make a bigger difference uh, by not playing or by playing and using that platform to further that message. And I think that's really the conversation um, players will be having, but I completely respect their decision either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a difficult one because even if you go back to like the 60s and the 70s, you, you had the, you know, sort of a Black Lives Movement or Civil Rights Movement back then, especially in the States. And when Martin Luther King got assassinated... Um, Bill Russell had a playoff game like a couple of days later, and they I think it was Bill Simmons asked him, you know, on on a show a few years ago, like how he dealt with that, and he said he didn't know now, and this is forty something years later, whether he should have played or not. Um, now they are they the Celtics played that game, um, and they went on to to do what they did. Um, it's it's such a difficult situation and Kyrie's getting a lot of stick for it but as I think he's one of the the, the representatives of the Players Association Vice President. so yeah so he's one of the guys who was going to stand up but you've got his argument which is fine and makes perfect sense and then you've got other NBA players who are saying well we will never earn as much as you earn in a year or whatever um, we you know we would prefer to play and get our salary and then it's the it's the the, the financials of the NBA and how does that work like 
can you lose all that TV revenue? And can you, we already lost money from China at the start of the year, which was, you know, unfortunate, but it was handled the way it was. And it was very strange to see sort of a sporting organization just sort of bow down to the Chinese government, but that seems to be coming a, a theme at the moment. Um, Corey's comments on that interested me on the, on the people want to play for money. Uh, yeah. In that he said they, they've, they've sort of, separated us as players based on a pay scale which seems to me yeah. to be sort of like are you arguing that you should all be paid the same because i'm sure that wouldn't sit well with with superstars in general with him <laughs> um so that, i found that sort of a weird weird position to make but it's not the weirdest thing he's ever said um but in terms of like i i kind of and again like i i get that my perception is I want to see basketball played. But again, this is a huge issue that needs sorting. And I feel that by playing and getting attention on the league, which will be the only sport played in the US at the time, essentially, that's yep. like, you know, the only major league, it it will hold that attention. And then you've got the platform for the players to speak there. Danny Green spoke about that um, recently. And the idea that them not playing it will still give them the same platform. My worry is that with the sports in, in New Zealand, in Germany, the, the Premier League starting again, there are going to be sporting distractions. Like yeah. America went nuts for the Korean Baseball League because they were so desperate for sports. And I worry that people who are not treating Black Lives Matter uh, as, as seriously as they should um, will be distracted and, and, and taken by these other sports. And I think those sports, although the Premiership are doing some fantastic things for for both the NHS and BLM, it's yeah. it's it's not going to carry the same gravity um, as as the NBA. Like as Matt said at the start, a predominantly black league. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, the Bundesliga is you know a German football league, and that has been the the, the record viewing figures they've had in the states the last few weeks have been ridiculous. And that's a, a soccer game. You know, it's a sport that most people around the world think Americans traditionally don't um, care about. But I guess with the, when it comes to the NBA, you've got like. Yeah, you can start and you can play the season, but what are you going to do during the season to draw attention to it? You obviously you can wear shirts and stuff, but the you know LeBron and guys like that have done that before. Um, owners might like run some sort of you know sizzle reel at the start of games, but what difference does that really make? I mean, a lot of these owners are you know very super rich white guys. Um, you know, as, as as bad as it is to say it, but they are the teams that are you know the wealthy teams. Steve Ballmer's worth. 51 billion or something ridiculous i think or the clippers um and it's a case of are they thinking finances above everything else and are they thinking we need to sort these you know we need to play games because we've got these pre-existing tv deals with espn and with all these other companies that we need to sort out i mean I, everyone's like well how are they going to split the games it's like well to be honest the tv company is just happy that they've got anything so they'll i think that they'll, they'll come to some sort of agreement and just split you know 50 50 or whatever but it is you're balancing future benefits for the world against you know keeping your league going now i guess do you, do you think they could have an impact though in the way that there will be some media there those <clears throat> those that media is focused purely on providing content for the sports pages you could get some incredible stories out of these players if you're in disneyland with these guys for 5 weeks and you can go one on one with you know like lebron james and talk to him about the racism that he's had throughout his career or you could you know you could get some real defining pieces of journalism over the next mm. over those five weeks i imagine but i'm just thinking if the players united you know, you know the way that we we sort of we mock russell westbrook for next question but if yeah. they literally in those those whatever form they will take there will probably be some kind of maybe it's behind like a, an ice hockey screen or something you know what i mean there'll be some <laughs> kind of press conference yeah. if every single player who goes up and is speaking just ignores whatever the question's about and makes it about BLM and social injustice, BLM. then then they that have a platform the there because the, the, the writers can write about the game, but that's Yes. Yeah. No one reads about game recaps anymore. They're not they're not the thing. We've got a three minute YouTube video for that. It's the content is gonna be, you know, creating these these articles about the players and the stories that are going on. They have a, a perfect opportunity to say yeah, we're playing basketball, but this is what you need to be writing about. Yeah, I, I was, it's interesting. I was listening to Howard Beck the other day, and he was talking about um, how 
US media has had no uh, guidance at this stage as to what access to players will actually look like in this environment. So Mm -hmm. it's difficult for media at this point, given the likely large expense in terms of staying in Disney for three months uh, with all the food and accommodation and all the stuff that that entails, when you don't really know for sure you're getting any particularly with obviously the whole point of the bubble is to minimize um, access and uh, it kind of exposure to as many people as possible. So uh, obviously media will have to be tested and everything as well. So we don't really know what media access is going to look like. But the other thing I'm interested in how is how the NBA deals with, um, let's take a team, let's take Boston, for example, and let's say, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown both decide they'd rather, uh, they think they can make a bigger difference by staying at home, uh, taking Mm -hmm. part in marches and doing that. And again, it kind of raises this point of an asterisk on the season as to, well, Boston didn't have their strongest team. So, or it, it could be more extreme than that. Maybe half of a particular roster decides not to play. How does, uh, a franchise and the NBA deal with that? Yeah, <laughs> it's an incredibly difficult question because if they, if, again, I, I've got nothing. If they if if they feel they can have the biggest impact, not going, don't go because this is yeah. this is bigger. The the sport will be there next year. The likelihood is, yeah, guys could lose out on a significant chunk of money. I get that, and that and then that will predicate their decision. But for the guys who are like, you know, the Browns, the Tatums, who have. have well, Brown, Brown signed extension the start of the season to kick in next year, I think. Um, guys who are, who are like that, then if you've got that financial security, then you absolutely do. Well, you do what's right for you anyway, but you've, you ha- you have an, an easier choice if you were to decide not to go. Yeah, it's quite strange because you've got like, obviously Dwight Howard came out and supported what Kyrie said. Mm-hmm. Um, Patrick Beverly went against what Kyrie and Dwight were saying and said that we do whatever King James does because he's our, <laughs> he's our leader. Um, but they were, there were reports coming out that there's other players who are, you know, in the Lakers locker locker room that have the same opinion as Dwight and that they're saying that that's not going to cause any problems between teammates. I mean, if, it's, if you're like in the Eastern conference finals and one of your star players decides he's going to go off to a March and then ends up getting the virus or whatever, are you going to be pissed off at him for that? Or like, it's, it's so it's so difficult working out how this is this is going to work because it's you know it is I hate using the word because everyone's using it at the moment but <laughs> unprecedented but you don't know there's no right or wrong answer here I don't I don't think the um, it's interesting you were talking about uh, Jason Tatum's contract uh, he he was the name that stuck in my mind when I was I was reading something the other day about how uh, players like him who are kind of due and will likely receive big money contracts um, Mm -hmm. are actually still waiting uh, to determine what their insurance looks like because they could go in this environment where they're more prone to injury for the various reasons we talked about. They could sustain a major injury and uh, sort of put in jeopardy their uh, sort of once in a lifetime contracts. So it's another thing to monitor because it may influence players' willingness to partake if they have that kind of money waiting for them next season. Same yeah. with Donovan Mitchell. I mean, it's just like... It's, it's, a, it's not... Well, obviously, the, the just 2020 is not the situation any of us thought we'd be in six <laughs> months ago. It's I, I know you hate it, using the just, word, but there is no precedent, therefore it is. No, this is totally you know, unprecedented. I mean, it's unbelievable how it's escalated from Rudy Gobert touching some mics after a post game to what it is now, where they're you know holding the they might hold the rest of the season in Disneyland, which is just and America hasn't even got this thing under control. That's one of the things. Like so, you know, they're still trying to play these sports. I think the MLS are going to be moving into the Disneyland as well, and their players are saying they don't want to you know they don't want to go from Los Angeles and and live in a hotel in Disneyland for for six weeks. They'd rather just stay in Los Angeles with their their family and stuff. And that's another thing. I guess if you're a single guy in the NBA and you go over there, it's fine. You can do what you want, but then you get sneak people in. I mean, is that, is that a thing that's going to be happening? <laughs> well, you were the one advocating for Devin Booker going on a road trip, so 
Well, they yeah. Well, they well Devon Brook is used to road trips by the <laughs> TMC says about him. So. <laughs> when he's not playing Call of Duty Warzone, which seems to have taken over every NBA player's life. At you the know, uh, the other thing to look out for is particularly on the teams who uh, are being brought in. Um, and like, let's take the Wizards, who more or less have to go eight and zero in the first games to even maybe have a chance <laughs> of uh, getting the eight seed. Come but on, Bradley Beal. Maybe uh, if you're a player on that team and you you don't fancy the idea of uh, isolating for three months with kind of really no chance of get, it's almost meaningless. Yeah. Uh, whether if you had a operation, you'd been putting off maybe now is the time to suddenly have that operation. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of teams that didn't make it. We're going to we're gonna roll through those quickly. Um, the Golden State Warriors were uh, perhaps the bigger, one of the biggest names that, that won't be returning. Um, they had an interesting season, didn't they? I don't think anyone expected them to have an amazing year um, after the, the, the turmoil they went through. But yeah, we'll have to see what happens with, with them next year. I mean, the long-term solution for them is to fix their front court i'd imagine and then work out what they're going to do with some of their sort of you know star players that are probably running towards the end of their um contract you know my my take on the warriors is that they it, how they do next season and the one after that actually impacts kevin durant's legacy more than anyone else's because if they disappoint <laughs> next season the kind of relative weight of, the, of his contribution, I think, in a lot of fans' mind, may shift. And similarly, if they come back as you know, with Andrew Wiggins as uh, as uh, Harrison Barnes, two point five, <laughs> two point five, <laughs> then suddenly KD just becomes uh, a glorified role player who just happens to take up, and uh, you know, a significant number of shots. Yeah. So it's it's going to be it's a lot of hinges on it, and they've got you know the, the draft this summer. They've got a chance to shore up a big man. They've done pretty well at taking um, low ranked big men and making them solid contributors. Whilst they've been there, Jordan Bell was was good there. Was his name Colin Jones? For all came from the G League, and all of a sudden, for like for about six weeks, it felt like he was the next big thing. They're quite good at slotting on at slot. Sl- put my teeth back in slotting in these <laughs> these um young athletic centers who can come and, and impact things on both ends of the court and then when you've got the greatest shooting backcourt of all time it kind of makes the offense a lot easier so yeah i think i think they've, next they've year they could be back protesting time. together haven't they clay mm. and curry there's been quite a lot of photos and video of them going about but they definitely need to look for a center or at least a center to take them into the future and then Perhaps a backup point guard to deal with the possible injuries that you you get with with Steph and um and Clay um and then just general perimeter depth. I imagine if you're just going to keep the same sort of philosophy that Steve Kerr's had. I've been reading um Ethan Sherwood Strauss's book actually, and it's it's amazing how much went on behind the scenes of of that team. And I know Ethan's like a quite divisive figure amongst Warriors fans, um but it's it's interesting getting his sort of inside look as to you know, why Durant went there in the first place and how Nike had, you know, their fingers in all the pies everywhere and they wanted to knock out Under Armour. And there's all these other underlying stories that you just don't really, you know, you're not going to know about unless you you end up looking at something like this or spending a lot of your time reading about those warriors, which obviously most of us did. So, And um, I think we're forgetting yeah. the biggest story of all. We're waiting with bated breath to see how Dragon Bender performs next season with the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> Josh Coyne certainly is. I know. I know that for a fact. <laughs> um, the the Cleveland Cavaliers are another one of the teams that didn't make it in. Um, key returners next year. Kevin Love's back. Um, maybe he'll get traded. Who knows? We've been saying that for the last six years. It seems. Uh, Colin Sexton, Darius Garland. Um, they've got player option on Andre Drummond and Tristan Thompson. <laughs> Um, so it'd be interesting to see what they do with those. Good for but them. They're a bit, yeah, they're just such a they're just a mess, aren't they? They just, own their own first round pick, though. So I guess that's a bad. Oh thing. dear. I, yeah. <laughs> I think about the Cavs, but... them and the Pistons. I just look at I, I look at both of their rosters, and I'm just like, what's what are you trying to do here? What are you doing? <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, the Minnesota Timberwolves are another one that, that's that, that's um, that's missing out. Um, they traded for D'Angelo Russell, obviously, at the start of this year to try and give themselves a bit more of a 
bit more scoring, but that hasn't worked out. They, they've had a tough time recently, especially Cat. I think he lost his mother over over the last few months, and they've been out vocally, all of them, obviously, after the George, George Floyd um, shooting and murder. They, they've all been, they've been out protesting for the city, which is good for them. Um, Long term, going forward for them, maybe a backup point guard, maybe a power forward. I just feel like, like the the Wolves need more Tim talent. Uh, obviously, Cat is as good as he is. Yeah, Delo, I think I'm a bigger fan of than most people. I like his ability to just have a pick and uh, create offense out of that. But I look at the rest of that roster. Yeah. I'm just like, it's just not good enough. They just need more talent overall. Unless mm. unless Josh Okogie steps up, yeah, I think Josh Okogie had an impressive season, but. Um... We we'll have to see what happens with them. I think they own their own first first round pick, and they've got Brooklyn's lottery protected one as well. I think so. We'll have to see what happens. Well, that's the thing: the draft this year. I've not. I mean, I'm not a college guy, as everybody that listens to the show knows. But like, I've not. They don't see much hype about this this college draft class that's coming up. I mean, am I wrong here? Or it's not as deep as it's been in in recent no. years. Again, I'm I'm not I'm not a massive college guy, but I I, I know enough about this draft class to know it's not not as exciting as we've been uh, blessed to have the past few years yeah usually you have names just flying around all over the place but I've I've not really seen seen any um the Atlanta Hawks are another team they're returning um their key free agent is is Jeff Teague I think they need wing depth and a backup point guard to help Trey Young out but they're they're in an upper trajectory anyway I think they just need to spend some more time together well yeah they could do without their Second best player missing twenty six games for PEDs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, what I mean, they they weren't looking too bad to start the season, but it was pretty soon after. What was it? A couple of games in, and then it was just season yeah. over. I don't know. Like <sighs> Trey's a phenomenal talent, um, but again, this you know, you mentioned earlier how teams who were built around one particular player um, might benefit from coming back to this this whatever this rest of the season is and I have worries about him if he becomes the isolation or um, the central figure for this team uh, he can he can he can score he can pass but he's a defensive liability he's undersized and he's not incredibly efficient which is a bit of a a red flag because if you're you can be a, a high volume scorer but that doesn't if that's not translating to W's I mean, it, it doesn't help that the rest of his team isn't great and he's been quite vocal already this year that he wants more talent around him. So he's clearly willing to to be part of a better team. But I don't know. I think there's I think there's there's limits to how much how far Trey Young will take you. Yeah, they made moves to get Cam Reddish in the draft and obviously he's had a he's had a, you know, an okay season, but there's nothing that jumps off the page there from him. I guess they're just hoping that John Collins comes through as being like the second guy there, but yeah, he's, they're, he's they're evolving. Very, very, you know, Collins is evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, if he, mm. if he carries on in this trajectory, he could be scary next year, not as quickly as next year. He's already one of the most athletic fours in the league. He's starting to step outside more and shoot, which is if you, if your big guy can spread the floor, that that's just what the modern NBA is. It just opens up so much more space for everyone else. Yeah. Um, I mean Jeff Teague. He's the one. That he's their free agent, their loan free agent this year. Um, do they keep him? Do they let him go? What do you think? I think he should leave and then go back again. <laughs> <laughs> go for the hat trick. Is he? Is he much why, more than, yeah, a, than a mentor at this stage in his career? No. You know, I think I think <laughs> I have uh, three uh, talking points on the Hawks. The first one is shout out to Vince Carter, who's. Uh, mm-hmm. Career now comes to a close. Greatest dunker of all time, in my opinion. The second is the weird front court they've built by acquiring Clint Capella, who yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. They they now who basically is like a pretty similar player to John Collins. Um, obviously, they have the slightly range. different strengths at some point, but like <laughs> I don't really view that as a complementary pairing. And with John Collins no. being one of your young stars, I don't, I didn't really understand that pickup, but I'm interested to see what that, what those guys look like playing together. And I think kind of, I'll go a bit further than you were, guys were with Trey Young. My worry for the Hawks is that 
if they're not able to kind of pick up more talent and um, look like they're going somewhere in the next few seasons, my worry around that is Trey Young is so putting up such big numbers and doing so much for that team that maybe he starts to get itchy feet after a couple of more seasons if they don't improve. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, th- well I, I think Capella's a back, um, the franchise's backup plan because of what happened with Collins this year. Because actually, the pick and the pick and roll. If you looked at how the pick and roll worked with Harden and Capella, that could be yeah, replicated was- with Trey Young and Capella. Um, I would pick John Collins over over Clint Capella, but <clears throat> maybe they got slightly nervy by having you know this this young stud that's supposed to be one of the cornerstones for the franchise missed so much time for a PED and it, I mean, this season sucked for the NBA in terms of like, on court action great but in terms of stuff going on off court is, is sucked the Detroit Pistons they're another one they finished the season with 20 uh, 20 wins um, which is not great uh What's there to say about them? <laughs> I mean, they need a long-term point guard. They need ta- talent in general. Um, Blake Griffin will be back next year, but uh, let's be honest, who cares? Uh, and that's that's, Derek that's Rose, sad, isn't it? Derrick Rose is back. It's it is sad. Yeah, I, I think um, yeah. The main talking point for me for the Pistons is around actually how it kind of got overlooked because of how bad the team was. That Derrick Rose actually had a really fantastic year, season. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, even like the young guys like Luke Kennard has not had anything, you know, worth shouting about. And they were going on about him perhaps being like one of the future corner pieces for the team. But who knows? Um, they do earn their first draft pick this year, so they, they've, they'll get something. Just, um, just on the, the Pistons, uh, if you haven't, and, and anyone watching or listening, if you haven't listened to uh, Woj's pod with Dwayne Casey from about two years ago now, Go and find it. It's phenomenal. This is a guy who, especially with what's going on now with Black Lives Matter, this is a guy who grew up in, yeah. in segregation. He worked in a cotton field. He was like one generation or two generations removed from slavery. It's like his story and how he, he came to where he is now is just it's one of the best listens I've I've had full stop. It's just it was so yeah. insightful and eye opening really. But go and check that out. Yeah, definitely. Um, the New York Knicks, they're another one that has, has missed out much to the you know the anger of um, NBA UK fans in, in this country. Uh, seems to be a lot of Knicks fans over here. Knicks, one of them. <laughs> um, they miss out. I mean, needs for the Knicks, long-term point guard, low-maintenance role players, dare I say it. New ownership. New ownership. <laughs> Go on, Nick, I'll let you take the floor on this one because I hate talking about the Knicks. Okay. Are you going to re-sign Bobby Portis? There you go. How long have we got, guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, obviously it was a it was a nothing season for the Knicks, but deliberately so. The the kind of <laughs> strategies shifted for this point in terms of writing off um, at least a few years with the aim of obviously acquiring talent through the draft. Uh, hopefully. Uh, being able to attract a marquee free agent if the possibility occurs. Um, But as we saw this season with uh, the management and the current perception of the franchise, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, A a couple of bright spots, I think. Um, RJ Barrett in particular, um, a bit like Derek Rose, it was a bit overlooked. Uh, quite, he had a fantastic season. Obviously, not he wasn't Ja Morant or Zion, but he was really, really good. And credit to uh, Tommy Beer on Twitter uh, for this one. But I saw this uh, yesterday, and it really caught my eye that RJ Barrett is one of only seven players in NBA history to tally at least 800 points, 250 rebounds, 100 assists, and 50 made threes before turning 20. The other six players who've ever done that in NBA history, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Carmelo, Jason Tatum, Luka Doncic, and Kevin Durant. So it's kind of... Elite company. He was kind of seen as not having a great year, but when you look at it in that context and you think about his age... Um, he's actually doing okay. Um, and the, the other bright spot was obviously Mitchell Robinson, who, again, and I don't blame non-Knicks fans for not watching Knicks games this season, but that guy is phenomenal to watch. I'm going to put him His up there. His handle is insane. 
but just in just Someone on a big. per minute basis in terms of like crazy things that happen on a court Mitchell Robinson he's either <laughs> fouling out in 5 minutes he's blocking 10 shots in 5 minutes and he yeah. never misses he's uh unless uh someone like Dwight Howard who is close to him uh overtakes him in the remaining eight games he's going to lead the league in field goal percentage yeah i think he hasn't taken he had, i don't think he took a three point shot all the season either no. which is you know insane so he's a true um throwback but it, it, watching some of his workout videos like to move to be the size he is and to move how he does with the ball it's just insane like he must be shooting 70 percent or something from around the rim because everything just seems to either go in and if it doesn't go in he grabs a rebound but i think i was watching one of the games early on the season and the, i think they were calling in the block nest monster or something it's just, <laughs> just like, that's a great nickname <laughs> I mean, come on it's brilliant um but yeah no mitchell robinson was definitely a highlight for, for them as well and i think julius randall had another solid year but that's kind of what <laughs> no, you're, I expect you're a from randall him. stan i um, forgot stan this for julius randall. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I actually think he um, he actually took a step back for me this season. I watched him a lot uh, last season and I was pretty excited the Knicks had signed him at what was quite a affordable contract for his performance yeah. level last year. And I think it's obviously with a grain of salt with how um, weird the team was and how like without really having... Um, Alfred Payton was our best point guard by a long way, which kind of tells you something about the team. Um, no disrespect to him. He was actually pretty good this year for his level. Um, but <laughs> we didn't really what even get... What a compliment. <laughs> you know what I mean. For, for his level. You know what I mean, though. He, he's like... <laughs> He's a starting point guard in the NBA, but he's never going to be like a top 10 point yeah, guard. So. No, no, no. <laughs> but he actually, I actually enjoyed watching Alfred Payton this year. Um, well, I thought they were going to move Julius Randle. I wrote a piece on the, the website about, like, I think it must have been January time, like, that he was just, he just didn't seem like he was, you know, he was playing okay, but he was having the odd night where he'd go off and then other nights where he just, you didn't really know he was on the floor. But um, he's one of those guys who I think just, didn't like the situation he was in. <laughs> the Bulls, uh, they finished the season with 22 wins. Um, what can we say about the Bulls? I mean, they, I think they need a playmaking guard because Zach Levine doesn't seem to do that for them. Um, Larry Marketing had a weird year, such a weird year that we debated where the hell he stood in our top 25 rankings the other night when we were all on online, which is something that we've, we've been working on. Um Wendell Carter Jr. is obviously coming back. We might get a better season from him. Kobe White. Um, Chris Dunn's restricted. Like, There's a few moves I think the Bulls can do. And they've uh, they, they, there's reports they might get rid of Jim Boyler as well. So Those reports should absolutely be confirmed because they should get rid of Jim <laughs> Boylan. But they've had a new GM. They've had a new um, president. Clear house. Yeah. yeah. They, they need to clear house, start again. Like they've got some young players who you know they're not the best of the best, but there is some young talent there they can build with. Um, Definitely, but yeah, Boylan, go, please yeah. get rid. Bring your in, bring please. your own guy in. Start afresh. Give Laurie Markin and some more touches so we can actually work out whether he's as good as we think slash hoped he would be. Um, yeah, they've already started though. They've started making the moves so. Feel positive. Yeah, the, I think the Bulls are a really weird one. They've got some young players I like, but they haven't been able to put the pieces together. I think uh, Mark and I'm a big fan of, and I'm a think. Um, I think teams may try and buy low on him in the off season, thinking they can get him for uh, not very much. And uh, he, he was hampered by injury a lot this year as well. So I don't think he ever really got going this season at all. And, and strategy I think, um, as well. Boy, uh, the, the quotes that came out the other week, Boylan saying, well, if you, you know, Mark and said, well, I'm getting less touches, like half the amount of touches. And Boylan said, well, mm -hmm. if you want more touches, get more rebounds. And I'm like, oh, this, is, <laughs> this is supposed to be like one of your guy, two guys, like run some plays for him. Sorry, carry so on. It's also why they drafted Wendell Carter, like, because he was, he is a defensive rebounder. That's what he does. That's what he did in college. But well, what was your next knows? point, Nick? <laughs> I, I'm I just sorry, gonna, I, I, jumped, I jumped in. I was just going to say, I, I think um, a lot of people have taken against Zach Levine this year. Um, and I think I kind of understand it a bit. I think he's been very frustrated with the team. 
uh, he's been on and the lack of winning. And so he I came feel from like Minnesota. He, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I feel like even then he kind of had more help than he's had this season. Fair. And he, he's been trying to win games on his own more or less, which is why he's ended up with like these 40, 50 point games and yeah, they still lose. Yeah. Um, and he, he got to that point where he was just trying to win them single handedly by the end. But Yeah which is what he did against the Hornets I seem to remember um, but they're the last team that obviously aren't making it in the, the Charlotte Hornets long term for the Hornets I mean apparently Michael's, Michael's got them watching um, The Last Dance or something to make them realise what it takes to win but I'm not too sure how much that's going to going to help I mean there's some good there's some good talented players there I like Devontae Graham um, BJ Washington looks pretty good as well Terry Rozier was a weird signing at the start of the season anyway but he seems to have made it work Um but they just need they need some defenders and probably another playmaker and a miracle. <laughs> a miracle. They they need an owner to suit up and come back down and get them an extra three games a year. <laughs> no, um, the, the Hornets is an interesting one. Again, I I think there's serious um, issues within within that franchise. Just the the fact that Jordan is is so adamant and hiring his his mates and he has yeah. his own little bubble that he's always wanted to work with which has always it's been his MO throughout his whole career he always wanted North Carolina guys signed but I think they you know they I guess <laughs> it's kind of so far <laughs> yeah right, I just think like there are better people out there and I get like he's loyal to his alum is it really alumnus no that's pop that's the <laughs> whatever it is he's loyal to the college but pff, yeah I, I just I, I think he's holding them back can I just take one uh, unorthodox take with the Hornets? I actually think they they overachieved this season. Mm. If you if you yeah. look if you look at the roster, I think that is the worst roster in the NBA. I was seriously shocked they managed to scrape tenth. Yeah, totally. I, I had uh, I think I had them down as being above the Cavs, maybe maybe not even that at the start of the year. But they're like Cap- the Cavs, but like without Kevin Love. It's yeah. I reckon poor I can Kev, find poor it. Kevin Love. Whilst, whilst Matt pulls up the, uh, the the questions, I reckon I can find the preseason power rankings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we had uh, Captain Kirk. If lockdown was lifted by the finals, would you still go to watch a match live in the states? I think air travel might still be a bit difficult, Kirk. If I'm being completely honest, but are we going to get an air bridge to to uh, to America no, like they're doing? Just today? travel in those think- like Zorb things. <laughs> Just like it would make going through the you know the little queue barriers at the airport. Ah, <laughs> oh, that'd be amazing. Um, I don't know. I'd, uh, I, would, I would. I would land. I would be PPE'd up. <laughs> Hazmat yeah. full gear. Yeah. But Fair enough. I don't know. It's a tough one. Oh, yeah, yeah it, de- it depends what the um, finals matchup is. <laughs> That if it was the Knicks, which is obviously going to happen, um, but no, I think it, it really depends what was happening with COVID nineteen. If if the numbers aren't where they need to be, it's kind of irresponsible f- to travel internationally unnecessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. <laughs> and this is the thing. Like we're talking about all this, and we might have a, f- a whole season next year with no fans in arenas, and it's you know we don't know at the moment. It's so. So strange. Um, Ross McLeod are the star of the Phoenix Suns a viable wild card to make the Western Conference playoff spot. Given the Spurs lost Lamarcus Aldridge and they have a healthy roster of Ricky Rubio, Devin Booker, Kelly Oubre, and Bridges and Aiton that can burn most teams. The thing is, I think they've got more of a chance than people give them credit for. <laughs> yeah. Look at how they the started De- the Booker season. Could just Bef- light you up before before. Even after Aiton, again, PEDs, Aiton went out uh, with his <laughs> suspension. Um, they were hot. They they started on a hot yeah. streak this season. If they can put something like that back together, then they absolutely have a, a chance of making the postseason, which is a scary thing to say about the Phoenix Suns. And it's, well, refreshing. It's a refreshing thing to say. <laughs> By the way, yeah. I found the, the power rankings. Um, oh, go on. I, ha- I had... The Hornets are heavy last with just 16 wins. That's how down on them I was. So they definitely have <laughs> overachieved. Sorry, Nick, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, yeah, I think um, I actually like a lot of the Suns roster despite their win total. In term, Like Aaron Baines, you didn't mention at the start as well. He's had an incredible season. Um, 
And yeah, I agree with Mike. They started the season unbelievably, which kind of tells you, uh, which speaks to coaching and preparation, which I think is a big advantage. And I think they're one of those teams where uh, the West is obviously still stronger than the East in terms of depth. If the Suns were in the East, they're probably making the playoffs in uh, the Get different the kind of settings. Yeah. 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 Um, we had another one from at Sambo Evo. Uh, where will Giannis Antetokounmpo end up next after Milwaukee? That's, this is making the assumption he's leaving Milwaukee, I assume. Florida? Florida? What, Orlando? <laughs> <laughs> In about five In about weeks' about time? Four weeks. <laughs> um, well, uh, God knows. Okay. Everyone goes Lakers, but I just can't be bothered. No. <laughs> it, I think Milwaukee is a big favourite to keep him but if he was yeah, to go mm-hmm. anywhere I'm throwing in Golden State he's like he's made a few comments which aren't which don't make me 100% convinced he'll stay obviously I think they're the favourites still and then obviously uh, New York are planning that far ahead but this is a guy who grew up in Athens the the Greek the, the Hellenic climate is uh, much more suited to the west coast <laughs> Go there. That's why the Lakers picked up his brother's uh, brother briefly. A um, lot of Greek people in game. New York. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Lakers playing the long game. Uh, yeah, that's that's. I think that was that was all the questions um, we had. Have you guys got anything you want to jump on quickly before we um, we call it a call it a week? Um, I mean, like it's been refreshing to talk basketball again, but. As we've alluded to several times, there's a massive social movement going on. Um, yeah, definitely. We're not in. I, I, I'll speak for myself. I'm not in a position of authority to speak about any of it, um, other than to condemn it as being as as uh, to condemn the system that it's that's being uh, fought against. Uh, the oppression's horrific. Whatever way you look at it, um, I'm trying to do my research. I'm trying to understand it more. But absolutely, there are big things going on. If the NBA decides not to go ahead this season, then it, it totally makes sense to me. There, they need this. This needs fixing. It's gone on f- far too long. Far too long. Yeah, it's. It seems that we're in the midst of a, a serious movement. Before, and my mm-hmm. parents are. You know, my mum's in her sixties, and my dad's a bit younger, but they've gone on about movements in the past and I don't think even they've seen anything that's been quite like this and quite as global and young people especially are really taking it and just running with it and I watched Dave Chappelle's um, Netflix special earlier and he was just saying how proud he is of all the young African Americans in the States who are standing up and just going out even if it makes no real difference to them you know even if they come from a fairly well-off African-American background or whatever they they're all still going out and I think it's just yeah, it, it, we're watching history and it's just a bit of a strange plot. Everyone's been cooped up indoors for months and there's a lot of pent up energy coming out, even on Twitter and things like that the past week. It's just been, it's just one of those things that we're all having to deal with at the moment. But um, yeah, we've, I'm, you know, fully behind, behind the movement and yeah, coming from sleepy Norwich, which to be honest is really disgusting because like most of it's racist in general. Um, we had a Black Lives Matter wall painted in the city a couple of weeks ago and it's been sprayed over a few times since which is you know ridiculous but unfortunately when you live in a sort of predominantly white county of the uk that tends to be seems to be a thing but you know that's that black lives sorry that's, sorry, that's one of the things is there's matter. this weird perception that this is an american issue and it is like a, whilst it's, yeah whilst <laughs> america might be the precipice because there is you know so much with the police and things like that it's absolutely rife here. Yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, my old history teacher, Mr. Edwin, he was, um, you know, he was a, a black history teacher and he was late to school once. And we asked him why he was late and he'd, he'd been pulled over by the police because they was someone had stolen a laptop or something and he had a bag and they were just wanted to check his bag. And, you know, that was, that must've been 11, 12 years ago now. And it is, it's ridiculous and it needs to stop. And it's, Personally, I think it's a generational thing. I think it's if your parents are racist, then you teach your kids to be racist and then they teach their kids to be racist and that's that's how it works. But there's no excuse now to not really educate yourself and to learn a little bit about what has happened and, you know, the history that this country in particular has 
mm-hmm. with the slave movement and and things like that. I mean, I studied history for three years. I studied and you know I've got a degree in it and everything, but we didn't touch on any of that. So, <laughs> just to add to that topic a little bit, I think one of the things uh, that's really been highlighted as an important thing is um, that not everyone has to sort of come out with some sort of statement constantly that a lot of what is important is listening to black communities and yeah uh, the messages they're coming out with i've ten i found that i've kind of naturally muted my own social channels a little bit for the last part of that was going through a tough period which i talked about a little bit at the start of this but also just yeah. not wanting uh, a lot of what i put on social in a normal environment is like tr- me trying to be funny and stupid stuff <laughs> or rubbish about the Knicks or whatever, but speak for yourself. In in the current climate, it just feels like you're putting out irrelevant noise, which isn't Mm -hmm. needed. So, Yeah, definitely. Uh, Well, in general, like this whole pandemic and me being on furlough and stuff, I've had days where, to be honest, I have just turned my phone off because being at home, you're just sitting there and I've noticed, because you you get your screen time report, don't you, on phones now. It tells you how long you've been looking at it and it's just gone up and up and up and it's just Mm -hmm. like, oh, hang on, just turn it off and you know, go and sit in the garden and read a book, which is something that, and I said to you, Mike, I was like, I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'm actually going to go and read this. And it's been enjoyable. Like I've never just sat down and done that before. I've always read books on like my lunch break or something like that, but just being, you know, we've had really glorious weather in the UK the last few weeks. So make the most of it is what I've, we've, we've been doing, but yeah, it's been fun to come back on the pod. Actually, I've, I've missed it a lot, but the last sort of few months for me have just been a bit all over the place and I had some other issues at the start of the year with my I you know identity and bits and bobs which I you know you guys know about so it's been a bit of a weird year um but hopefully you know we'll we'll start cracking on and we have got the top 25 European players coming out at some point um I think we're targeting the opening week of July so we're we're cracking on with that at the moment um and then hopefully with if we get some games back, we can do more regular pods. But even, to be honest, even if we don't get games back, the NBA has been doing a really good job of showing some vintage games. Sky Sports in particular, they showed Vince Carter's classic highlights last night, which was fantastic. Um, and, you know, we're getting a real presence over here, especially with the last dance at the moment. There seems to be quite a lot of buzz and traffic around basketball at the moment. I'm certainly seeing that on my Twitter feed and my Instagram and stuff. And even friends that I have who have no influence whatsoever you know no interest sorry in in basketball have suddenly taken interest just because of that documentary that was on that you guys you know watched and have talked about previously so it's a strange time but you know basketball can bring everybody together i think so <laughs> certainly brings us all together anyway. yeah just just a quick uh thought on the last dance and um people's reaction to it and it's something i've uh thought for a long time based on how i got into the game where the game was on channel four i think Mm -hmm. it's kind of further evidence that it's an exciting and good enough sport that if you put it in front of enough people people love it and i think the last dance has shown that and it kind of uh shows the importance of not only the um major broadcast deal with uh, Sky Sports in this country, which does a great job uh, with the coverage. Shout out to Mo, who does uh, good stuff with Sky. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, if we were able to get the NBA on uh, free TV, I think that would have a major impact on people picking up the sport. Yeah, Yeah, I'd I'd agree with that. I've got to admit, like um, because of the last dance and because of the situation we're in, a lot of work now because I'm, I'm I'm not furloughed. I'm, I'm working from home, so that's a lot of conference calls. And people go, "Oh, you've got a lot of basketball you, stuff. <laughs> you like basketball? Have you seen the last dance?" I'm like, "Yes, several times. Let's have this conversation." And uh, the general Fucking public crazy. who have never followed basketball <laughs> at all really enjoyed it. So it's great, yeah. great for the sport, but great it, for. If, even my dad watched it. I went in the living room one night, and the last dance was on, and I nearly had a heart attack, which was, you know, considering before it's been like, why, why did you get into basketball of all things? Like he never took me to any games or anything. So NBA two K is the reason I'm here. <laughs> um but yeah please check out the website doubleclutch.uk if you've enjoyed the podcast please do give us a review on iTunes or whatever platform it is that you're on. Um, you can subscribe on Spotify and everything as well. And you might have noticed if you're on YouTube that we're on video. Um, so hopefully we'll have a video going up soon. Mike's leading the revolution when it comes to video technology. So we'll Am leave I? that one to I, him. I'm, I'm shouting loudly about we need to do more of it. I don't know if that's leading the revolution. 
That's why I'm worried because I had a shave today and I look like a baby. So, you know, I am almost 30, <laughs> folks. I'm not actually 19, um, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, yeah, but please send us your questions. Um, admin at doubleclutch.uk. Check out the website for some fantastic articles that have gone up um, recently. Josh Coyne wrote one in particular, which is well worth um, your time. And yeah, just get involved in the conversation. Use hashtag Emmy in the UK. Watch whatever you can and uh, keep in touch. You got anything you want to say? All good here. All good Thanks here. and stay safe, everyone. Mm. You always come up with a better for closers than me, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done one in about three months, so I'm, I'm cutting myself some slack. Right, anyway, catch you uh, next week, folks. 